Great job, choir. One of my favorite songs. Um, so thanks for doing that. Well, today we continue in this series called uh, Grace, Gratitude, and Generosity. At the very beginning of the service, what I said was, this is a great framework for the Christian life. It's a great description of the abundant life that Jesus Christ came to give us. We begin with grace, the great truth of the gospel, that we are loved deeply by God. Not because of anything that we do or that we don't do, but because he just loves us. In other words, it's an unconditional love that we can't earn or buy or in any way get except as just a pure gift from him. We wanna put our roots down deep in that truth. That's where you begin. If you don't begin there, It's like having the wrong foundation on a house. You never get it right. In response to that, we give thanks. We have gratitude in our lives. In the Christian life, I said in one of the sermons, great description is God gives us grace and we spend the rest of our lives saying thank you. We're on our knees. So our life is a life of abundance. When you have gratitude, your heart is full. And so we give thanks to him and live our whole lives saying thanks. Remember I said, we're never at our, never better than when we're grateful. We are at our best selves when we're grateful people. Then what what do we do? We give out of generosity. We respond to to God in gratitude and then we give our lives generously. Everything that he has given us, we then give back to God and we give to others. Grace, gratitude, and generosity. Now the key to all this, maybe one of the the keys, is we gotta know that God is good, that God has good things for us. And that's why grace is so important. I love the scripture that we just read from Matthew chapter seven where Jesus said, you know, if your son asks you for a, For bread, will you give him a snake? (laughs) No. So how much more, Jesus said, will God give us good things? Because he's good. And as we've been singing all morning, he can be trusted. Now, one of the hardest places that we have to trust God, I would say, is with our money. And we're gonna talk about that today. One of the most difficult places for us to really trust God at his word is what we do with our money. I have to warn you, I love talking about money. I love talking about stewardship. I don't, I'm not shy about it at all because I think it, it gets to the heart of our lives as Christians, maybe more than anything else. Some people will say, Why are you talking about money? That's not a spiritual issue. Oh, baby. (laughs) It is very much a spiritual issue. It's right at the heart of who we are. I think if we are to go deeper in our walk with Christ and to really experience all that he has for us, money is a very important issue. As Brianne said earlier, my my associates today are just giving my sermon before I give it, it's so great. As she said earlier today, Jesus talked a lot about money. More than any other topic, did you know that? Except the kingdom of God. We look at things like faith and we say, oh, faith, now that's a spiritual issue. That's what we should be talking about on Sundays. (laughs) Or prayer, there, that's a spiritual issue. Well, do you know that uh, in the entire Bible, there are 500 verses on prayer and about 500 or so on faith. Money and possessions account for over 2,000 verses in the scriptures. Twice as much as those deeply spiritual issues of faith and prayer. 16 of the 38 parables that Jesus taught had to do with money and possessions. Jesus talked a lot about money and there are good reasons why. So we're gonna do it today and I'll be reading 
from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, beginning at verse 19. But before I do that, let's pray together. Lord, I pray that our hearts would be open to receive uh, your truth today, that you would just speak so clearly to us about this issue of money and how we are to be generous with our money. Lord, speak to us clearly with uh, power and with full conviction. In Christ's name we pray, amen. So from Matthew chapter six. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where Moth and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and and money. So the question is, today, why is money so important to God? And why does the Bible talk so much about money? Well, here's the first thing I would say, is money is powerful, isn't it? It's powerful. Let me see if I have a dollar bill here. This is so much more than a piece of paper, isn't it? Our bait statements, the coins that we have, the money that we have in our wallet, our possessions, so much more than just a piece of paper. It's power, money, possessions. It's a power that can shape our lives. We all know this, don't we? Think about how money shapes how we see ourselves and how others see us. Money can determine a lot about our our self-esteem. Somebody with money is treated much differently than someone without money, is it not? It can define who we are. Take a poor guy, give him some money, a lot of it, all of a sudden, he's a different person. Not really, but how we see him and how he probably sees himself is different. You know, and as a youth pastor in Pleasanton, we had a man at our church who was an executive at the GM plant down in Fremont, which I think now is the Tesla plant. But at that time, it was GA, a GM plant. And one day, he came up to me and he said, Steve, you know, from time to time, GM lets me uh, have a car that I can drive around for a while. I right now have a convertible, a red convertible Corvette with a tan top. He said, would you like to drive that for a few days? I said, of course not. <laughs> no, I didn't. I said, of course I'd like to drive a Corvette for a few days. I said, would you like to drive my 68 VW van with a big dent on the side for a few days while I have this? He said, no, that's okay. I think I can get another car. (laughs) Amazing. As I drove this car around town and around the Bay Area, how much differently people looked at me. How I saw myself differently. It was like the old Yiddish proverb, you know, with money in your pockets, you are wise and you are handsome and you sing well too. (laughs) It's true, isn't it? Here's one thing I noticed for sure. Women were looking at me a lot more than when I was driving my 68 VW van. Now, what was it? Oh, well, look at this guy, this young guy, 27 years old, driving a vet, a brand new vet. Must be smart must be wealthy, very different than when I was driving my old beat up VW van. Wealth is a power. We know this, don't we? Why do we sometimes buy these 
such expensive cars. Well, at least in part, I would venture to say it's how it makes us look. Money and possessions can shape how we see ourselves and how others see us. It's true. Let me give you another example. Ever had your credit card declined? The clerk at the counter, oh, I'm sorry, but in very hushed tones. <laughs> so as not to embarrass you, I'm sorry, but your credit card has been declined. You poor, pathetic person. <laughs> or have a check bounce. Or have creditors come after you. I talked to an old friend of mine just two weeks ago who, whose mother was sick. He lived on the East Coast. She lived on the West Coast. He, she, he was flying back and forth a lot, was not doing well financially at that time, and so put all these flights on his credit card. Other things started piling up. Before you knew it, he was $55,000 in debt to credit cards. It's not a good situation. <laughs> and here's the deal. Here's what he told me. Steve, I felt, I felt so horrible about it, is what he said. My self-esteem was just as low as it has ever been. Money shapes how we see ourselves. Second thing, money is a power that is so powerful it can ruin people's lives. 30 years of ministry, I can tell you, I've had many situations where I've sat in my office and have talked to people whose lives have been ruined because of the love of money. And it's partly what I was talking about last week with greed. They lose track of what's really important. It's like what it says in 1 Timothy, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and have pierced themselves with many griefs. We all know people who have forfeited their, their families and their, their marriages, sometimes their very lives, honestly, because of money, gaining too much weight in their lives. Money is powerful. And don't think we all don't buy into this. Don't fool yourselves. We are like fish swimming in a sea. <laughs> it influences us. Money is powerful, so powerful, Jesus says, that it can shape our hearts and ultimately shape who we are. Jesus says a very interesting thing in these verses. Here's my prop for today. I went to great lengths, went to Michael's to get this. Spent a lot of money on this. <laughs> this is your heart. This is money. We're familiar with this. I just talked about it. And this is your heart. I talked about this last week. The heart in the Bible is the center of who we are. You know, in, we think more like Greeks. We kind of divide the, the mind and the heart. But is what Jesus is thinking and what the Bible really says is the heart is the combination of the mind and what we think of it as the heart. It's where your decisions are made. It's the center of who you are. It's what guides you in life. It's your values, your priorities, all those things that determine how you live your life. The heart is all of those things. For most of my Christian life, when I read this verse, here's what I thought it said. I thought it said, and this is how I understood it, what happens here will guide this. And see, partly this is because I'm a pastor and I, one of the things that is very important to me in ministry, if not the most important thing, is transforming these things in us. As we come to know Christ, he transforms our heart, transforms who we are, changes us. And so for a long time, and even as a pastor, when I would teach on stewardship, I always thought, well, if people's hearts are transformed, this will follow. 
As our hearts are changed, it'll determine what we do with this. And in part, that is true. So for years, this is what I taught. You know, I just, I didn't teach so much about this. I talked about this. But Jesus is saying something very different. Do you see what Jesus is saying? He's saying, where this goes, this follows. Big difference. Where this goes, this follows. This determines this. This shapes this. That's a powerful statement, is it not? So Jesus is saying, what you do with this is so powerful. And you see, this is why money is so important to God. What you do with this shapes this and who you are. This follows this. Keep that picture in your mind. This shapes this and ultimately shapes who you are. That's powerful. See why Jesus talks so much about money? He doesn't say this about anything else. He doesn't say prayer shapes this, although it does. He doesn't say what you do with your time shapes this, although it does. He could have said those things, but he said this shapes this because he knows how powerful this can be in our lives. So the implications for this are these. You wanna become a more generous person? Give this away. Be generous with this <laughs> and you become a more generous person. You wanna start caring about homelessness? Give this, and we know this is true, don't we? Give this to an organization that works with homeless people and this will follow. Our commitments follow this. It shapes this, shapes this. It's a powerful thing. Where your treasure is, what you do with your money shapes who you are. It's powerful. Jesus says money is so powerful that it can rival our relationship with God. He says something very interesting here. He says, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. You cannot serve both God and money. This is a strong statement as well. What Jesus is getting at here is this. This is a really important theological theme in scriptures. We are created to worship God. C.S. Lewis says this. He says, we are created to worship God. This is the way we are wired. To worship God, to give our hearts to something, to serve something. We all are going to have a master it's all the same thing. We are wired that way. We're gonna worship, we're wired to worship God. If we don't worship God, we will certainly worship something else. Great truth, great insight, isn't it? We look around, you can see it. We all worship something. If we don't worship the living God, we will worship something. I remember I lived in Burlingame every Sunday in the fall, not every Sunday, but many Sundays, I would see all these people lined up at the bus stop in red and gold, <laughs> getting ready to go up to Candlestick Park to worship the fort. This is when the, the Niners were actually kind of worth worshiping, maybe. <laughs> the glory years lined up for some of those people, honestly. The 49ers were what they worshiped. It's what they gave their heart to. You can see it in all kinds of things. If we don't worship God, we may worship a hobby. 
It's something that gets us up in the morning. Something that, and here's, it's what we're talking about here, or idols. We look to it to give us something that only God can give. We'll look to it to give us something that only God can give, and we'll always be disappointed. We can look to our careers to give us life. We can look to material possessions. We can look, and usually idols are really good things. Money is a good thing. God never says that money is not good. It's a gift that he gives to us. But when we give it too much weight in our lives, when we look to it to give us what only God can give, it's not a good thing. We'll always be disappointed. We'll never be satisfied. Idols promise a lot, but they never deliver the goods. We're made to worship God. If we don't worship something else, or if we don't worship God, we will certainly worship something else. Jesus says you can't worship God and money. Again, doesn't say it about anything else, although there are many good things we can worship. But Jesus, for some reason, picks money and says, be careful about this. Because perhaps more than anything else, this can rival our relationship with God. And when you think about it, it's so true, isn't it? We can look to money to give us security. We think the bigger our account, the more secure we are. Oh, it's not true. Only God can give you ultimate security. We look to money to give us joy. It can give us some joy. It's not give you the joy that God's gonna give you. We can look to give it significance, like I talked about earlier, all those things. Perhaps more than anything else, money is something that we can look to. I believe it's the idol of our country today. There's no doubt in my mind, more than anything else, it's the idol of our country. Jesus says, be careful. Because what you give your heart to is so very important. And maybe more than anything else, we can look to, to money for security and for hope and for life itself. And that's why money is so important to God. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, we... Thank you for the good news that, that you are a good God and you have good things for us and you love us and you're a jealous God that wants to be at the center of our lives. Lord, you warn us that maybe more than anything else, money can be the thing that we look to, to give us what only you can give us. So Lord, as we think about what we do with our money, may we be guided by what you say. And may we remember that indeed you are a good God who we can trust. We pray all these things in Christ's name, amen.